Hello, everybody, and welcome to DREAM, the tutorial of disentangled representations for efficient algorithms for medical data. Can uh, you somebody tell me that they can hear me okay? Uh, just on the chat. All right, great. Thanks, Omar. So uh, while we wait for more people to join in, I'll quickly get started and just tell you a little bit about us. So this uh, this is the second year's tutorial. We did a very successful one in 2020 last year. Uh, and uh, this year we decided to expand the team. So we have uh, uh, three new faces. We have Xiao, um, he's a PhD student in my group. We have Pedro, also another PhD student in my group. Uh, and Spiros, who's a postdoc. And of course, uh, we, we have Alison from Canon Medical and myself, uh, who you will see in the first part of this tutorial and then again towards the end. Also, different to this year, we have a full set of uh, notes uh, that you can find on the archive version of the paper uh, there. And also we have um, a, a comprehensive website and a GitHub collection. And I'll show you screenshots of that uh, in the end. Just some very standard uh, disclaimers that uh, very standard disclaimers that everything we use here, we try to keep it only for educational purposes only. And we try whatever can to attribute to the source and provide uh, the sources uh, where we obtain the sources. Uh, if everything has something has been missed, it falls, it falls under the fair use uh, exclusion. So if you have any question to any of us, please use the Q&A button in the bottom. Uh, we can do so, do the, you can type them as we speak and then we will answer them during the Q&A. And if we don't aim to answer them all at the same time, we will try to answer those uh, after uh, in the break or in any of the breaks or at least follow up with you uh, via Affable or so on. Of course, if you have questions after the tutorial, please do send us an email, or if it's during the conference, try to use the Pathable uh, chat. So, uh, something very quickly, we realized that the sessions, the way they're set up in Pathable, there will be different Zoom links. So the first session, this one will be a news, a one Zoom link, and then all the other ones will be another. So unfortunately, you will have to exit, go grab a coffee, and, and come back to join the rest of uh, the sessions. So, a very brief uh, uh, outline is that uh, we will start with motivation, which is exactly what you will hear after this. Then we move on to the fundamentals, learning a bit about representations and generating factors, which you probably heard also from the previous sessions in the previous uh, uh, dream tutorial. But this year we also have a new causal perspective to representation learning and the generating factors. Then we're gonna move to part three on standard disentangling models. And here the new thing is um, on, uh, uh, we have normalizing flows and we still talk about a little bit more of the different models, uh, some newer guns that uh, Shao is gonna show you as well. Part four is gonna talk about building blocks and metrics. So how do we actually build together uh, disentangling models? How do we introduce uh, model design to the process? And then we discuss also some metrics that measure disentanglement, including some very recent work. And part five is um, we'll talk about disentanglement applications in computer vision, medical image analysis, and electronic health records. And part six, and I think it's going to be a very exciting session this year, we're going to have a roundtable. So rather than us talking, we have several guests across the world uh, that I'll show you their faces in one minute where we discuss about what can we do with disentangled uh, representations. So this is the timeline. So for the next uh, uh, hour or so, less than an hour actually, it's you're gonna hear from Pedro and a little bit from myself. Then we have a five minute Q and A and then a break. Then in the new, we have to exit the system. You go get the new pathable, click the new join meeting, and then you will join in a new session where Xiao and Spiros will tell you about disentanglement models and building blocks. Short break again, stay on the same session. Alison uh, and Spiros will talk about applications, then another final short break, and then we have the round table, uh, an open discussion where we will have several guests. We'll have some guests with known faces here in the Rikai community, uh, like we do, Shadi, uh, Andy King, 
bank locker, but also from the broad uh, computer vision and machine learning community. So we will have some material from Francesco Locatello, who's very well known in, in this entanglement, and also Yeri so, uh, that will talk about his work on latent optimization. So um, some of the guests will be live, uh, some of them will be quasi live uh, by showing us a pre recorded video. Uh, and uh, Francesco, we will have some slides and we will have the Chao uh, acting as if it's Francesco reading out his slides. Just to remind you of this extra material, we have a full blown uh, uh, tutorial style paper describing what we will show you today so you can see them being accompanied together. And also, we have a GitHub where we collected all the information. Uh, such as code, the data sets available, direct links that you can easily follow uh, 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 follow through. So without uh, further ado, let me get started about the motivation. I'm going to keep it short and sweet because I think uh, you probably know why you're here. So otherwise, you wouldn't be this in the tutorial. So we have medical image analysis is basically the, the bread and butter of this community. So we have to work on how we can extract information from a variety of types of images, whether they are in two dimensions, two dimensions plus time, 3D or 3D plus time. Some of them have intensity profiles that vary. Some of them have intensity profiles that are quantifiable, like you can think of like CT imaging. And the goal is to extract information out of either it's biomarkers or we need to essentially measure the size of a pathological region or we need to register them. And of course, we sometimes think about integrating them with other examinations that happen in a hospital or other information that we have for the patient, like text, laboratory exams, or clinical information that we have. And all the while, we need to do this to be robust. So if you think about, we need to create algorithms that will work across different tasks, that will work across different hospitals and scanners, uh, let's say 1.5 Tesla versus 3 Tesla, or different even populations, which is relatively hard, actually, as you can imagine. Um, and despite the fact that we don't have enough uh, and perfect training data, so collecting data, as you probably know, is not easy. Uh, there is privacy and cost implications. Our notations are costly themselves is because we have to rely on experts. And at the same time, our experts, uh, no matter what, uh, they do carry their own, I would say, uncertainty. There are no noises of whether they are well trained or not, less trained, or we have given them different types of um, guidance on how they should annotate. So if you think about what is the role of AI within healthcare, you can think of it using machine learning as means of delineating pathology or delineating anatomy, uh, classifying the presence of disease in an image or so on. If you want to be a little bit more futuristic, you can think of predicting the next evolution of events or the next uh, state of a patient um, or the next time point in a time series, you can think about like that. Once we have a good understanding about the phenotype, the information we extract from images, we can combine them with genomics and we can do population phenomic studies where we can try to understand better the disease. And then once we have a good understanding of disease and understanding what are the relationships, uh, and the complexity of the disease, we can start thinking of, can we use AI as a way of optimizing and describing treatment? And of course, we are here to convince you that in order to do all of this, we need to have uh, better uh, uh, representations. So uh, this entanglement has been increasing the popularity. Um, it's, if you, this is kind of like the a trend of Google Scholar query on uh, this entanglement and only on archive. A few years back, the Scientific American had a, an article about the evolution of AI and how we're going to go to general uh, artificial intelligence. And disentanglement was a prominent uh, feature there. So, uh, so definitely a lot of the number of works is increasing. Definitely, we're not going to be able to cover them all. As you can tell, we have more than, let's say, 2,000 papers just this, uh, this year alone. So. But we hopefully, by sitting in this tutorial, you will see that machine learning is not a functional mapping between just, you know, this is the desired input and this is the desired output. There is an internal representation, internal latent space that we're trying to, um, to under provide meaning to the data and to the relationships that we want to exploit. And disentangled representations will allow, allow us to 
a be able to achieve semi-supervised learning, hopefully learn general representations that can be fine-tuned, uh, allow us perhaps to develop solutions that offer explainability, they can able to capture causal relationships that we know about the variables, and hopefully be towards more fair uh, uh, solutions. So uh, can you please mute? Uh, sorry, let me find the person who is not muted and I'll mute them. I wish I can tell what's going on, but okay, now they're muted. It's done. Thank you. So um, then uh, hopefully this thing will bring us to the return of principle design. And what do I mean by that is that we used to be in the past that actually we will design the representation, we will extract features, and then we will use machine learning. So uh, I would like to see this idea of going back to our roots of understanding and providing our own intuition and our own uh, understanding about the domain uh, as a way of developing systems. And I think this is also going to happen uh, in the round table. I think something that's going to be discussed a, a lot as well during the end. And hopefully this will also provide more efficient solutions where we are more robust to new applications. So hopefully at the end of the day, uh, you will re maybe either not learn, but at least review the, understand the meaning of a representation space and why invariance or equivariance matters. Uh, what is information bottleneck and how compositionality and the generative factors come together. You will learn some of the objectives for achieving this entanglement and some of the limitations and the important role and balance between inductive biases, data, and then so on, and other practical, useful things to know if you want to design a model yourself. Uh, and then you will, you, you will see different models and applications and get inspired by those as means of addressing uh, your future uh, problems. So that's uh, enough about myself. So uh, about my part, at least in this uh, first hour. So to recap, I think we just gave you a very brief introduction about why we should worry about this entangled presentations. And coming up next, you will talk about the fundamentals and Pedro is going to walk you uh, uh, through them. So that's me for now. And I'll switch now to Pedro. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks, Otos, for the, for the nice motivation, introduction. Uh, let me start sharing from my current slide. Yeah, hopefully now you can see. Uh, yes, cool. Right. So my name is Pedro, and I just started the timer here, so almost time. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Pedro, and I'm going to present the fundamentals part for you and we're going to cover some theoretical part around representation learning and the understanding of generating factors uh, from from a compositionality perspective and a, and a causal perspective and move to these integral representations and try to define try to explain uh, in a formal definition of these integral representations and uh, some identifiability results and why it's important that we understand our problem pretty well and define and introduce some domain knowledge for, for this entanglement. Okay, let's start uh, slowly with, with model learning, which is basically learning a mapping between uh, an input X and output Y. Uh, we're usually uh, very used to the setting and in a supervised learning setting, we usually have these pairs of input output and you use them for training our model. And in same supervised learning, which is one of the interesting applications of this entanglement, we have uh, X and Y pairs for part of the data and for the other part, we only have input data available. And in the case of unsupervised, we basically just have input data. We don't have labeled information for for, for learning our model. 
just started slowly. And <clears throat> the idea here is that we're gonna shift a bit from this paradigm of from input to output and to have a compositional view of our function f as here as this e of phi and d of theta where the e is an encoder that maps our maps a, an input data to a later representation and then we also have the decoder that's ma mapping the later representation to an output and this output this decoder can be virtually anything a classifier aggressor you can be trying to reconstruct the input. Uh, it, it is very flexible. It's a very flexible definition. But the important thing is that we're defining f as a composition of two functions with a latent representation in the middle. And with the correct learning objective, the goal is to be good at the task in hand. So learn uh, to be good at learning to predict why why you're learning a good representation for z. Uh, so that's what the aim well, in, in representation learning. So let's try to illustrate that with, uh, with an example. Uh, so in the example of building a car detector, if you imagine more specifically putting a bounding box uh, around each of these cars in the image, there are two questions that arise. What are the properties that are like our representation to have? And also, how do we define an objective function such as our encoder will achieve these properties for a later representation. Uh, so there are two properties that we think are very important and they, these are basically guiding the rest of the, the fundamentals presentation from now on. Uh, so going back to the car task, one of these important properties is equivariance. Uh, when you talk about equivariance in the example of the car detection, uh, for example, if they change the location of the car, we expect the result to change accordingly. So if we move our car to the left, we expect our bounding box to move to the left. And the other property is invariance, which basically means that uh, the, the correct location should be respective of day, night, car color, any of these things uh, that are not important for the task at hand. Uh, so in, in medical imaging, for example, segmentation would be uh, a task that is invariant to, to the style of the image. Uh, so it is equivariant to the location. So if I move, if I move my, my heart or any anatomical structure that I'm trying to segment, I want my segmentation to move. And classification of a pathology, for example, would be a task that is invariant to location. Uh, if I change my location, I don't want my classification to change, right? Uh, my disease classification to change. So these properties change with the task. And just trying to define in a more formal way, uh, equivariance first, a representation Z uh, is equivalent with a transformation omega if the input of the transformation can be transferred to the output. So basically we defined the, this mapping here. And here we can see that if we apply our transformation to the, to the input data and then pass it through the encoder, we want it to be equivalent to passing the input to the encoder and then applying a transformation, right? Uh, some important remarks here is that first, the a sufficient condition is that for, for M to exist is the encoder to be invertible, but this assumption is often too strong. Uh, so we want basically M omega to be simple. And while omega can be arbitrary, it happens to have desired geometric properties, which, is, which are the things that we can enforce with domain knowledge, as I said before, uh, in medical image segmentation, we know the, the, the properties that we want to have. Uh, invariance is a special case of equivariance where, where the, the mapping becomes an identity map. So if I, if I change my input, I don't want my output to change, right? I, I want it to be invariant to the, to the change in the input. Uh, so finding a suitable omega uh, is basically defining things that we want to be invariant or equivariant to. So we, we're basically looking for a set of omegas that, that we, we can 
have these properties. So the key questions there are, uh, how do we define the, these transformations? And once we have them defined, how do we enforce this kind of invariances and equivariances? So let's now go back to the generating factors, which is a concept that basically uh, define the underlying variables that characterize, that fully characterize the variation on data. So you can see here uh, some of the generating factors of these, these three images. So here you can have, you have, for example, style, scaling, rotation, and uh, yeah, the, the specific variables. And that explains a bit why supervised machine learning is so data hungry. If you imagine, for example, a problem where you have the back to the car problem going from left to right, if you imagine a camera pose where you have four variables here, uh, some lighting conditions, type, position, color of the light, texture, material, scene, scene layout. If, if you get just these, uh, these generating factors here, you have many labeled examples to cover all the desired variability. So why is that? So if you have, if you now imagine that we assigned, we say that each of these variables can be uh, assigned a thousand different values, the total images, different images that you can obtain is 10 to 39. So that's clearly uh, a combinatorial explosion. So uh, accepting, so enumerating all the, the possibilities is impossible. And a, a consequence of that is that a Z that is optimal for a specific task is maybe not optimal for all the other tasks, right? So, <clears throat> we can also define the difference between the real and the learned factors. So a learned factor is the ones that you can learn from data. The, the real are the, the real physical mechanisms that why this is happening, uh, that define why this is happening. And hidden are the ones that determine, determine other values. So we're gonna see in the causal, uh, in the causal part later that these can also be count confounders. Uh, so basically our goal is to to find representations where the learned factors come as close as possible to the real factors. So in medicine, when you look at med uh, medicine and healthcare, uh, this, the problems are, are truly complex. If you imagine all the possibilities of, of the complex interactions between factors, uh, that disease diagnosis, for example, is something that takes into account the relation between several different generating factors, uh, generating variables. And it is at the same time uh, a challenge and an opportunity because you can know the factors, but we have a lot of domain knowledge. It, it allows enumeration of all these factors and it, it's easier to define which ones we wanna be invariant or equivariant to, right? Um, one thing that basically happens, always happens, and is data set with biases. We, we, we can see that the most synthetic in, in toy data sets, the, the factors are seem to be independent, but correlation to factors is always present in, in the real life. Like uh, in reality, can a car, can I have a car without wheels? It's not something that is very common, uh, yeah. A table, a table without chairs. Uh, some combinations never happen, so they they are determined by the facts that are present there. So we, we refer here to this to this large study uh, on these integral representations to, that that try to to alleviate that. Uh, basically, these factors that are correlated. So now, looking from a causal perspective. We just saw that learning the generating factors is not enough. If the factors are correlated, if there is bias in your data, is because there is a stronger kind of type of relation between them. Uh, there is a causal relation. For example, the, the, the presence of a car causes the presence of wheels. And when, when you have two variables that are correlated, there, there is two hypotheses. One, one is the cause and the other one is the effect. And 
and the other possibility is that there is a confounder that is causing uh, both of them. But one thing is that this, these relations, they are directional. So if you make an intervention on the cause, it will change the effect, but not the other way around. So this perspective is useful because you can try to create these relations about all the variables in your problem. And this allows a much deeper understanding of the, of the domain you're working of your problem. So something that is very useful that is done in this paper because a little matters in medical imaging is that they try to trace they try to create this causal graph, which basically enumerates uh, several important variables in the in medical imaging, and they try to connect them with causal relations. So basically, you can start in your train test split, and then uh, see your acquisition conditions. So basically, which kind of which kind of scanner you're using, uh, which hospital are you? Are you acquiring these images? Uh, you can see the patient characteristics. And here uh, you have a way of choosing uh, the, 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 the thing test set. Which annotators, what's the population of your annotators? Uh, how each annotator will annotate in a different way your image? All these things uh, are useful to, to become to, to understand the relations between them in your data set. So basically you can choose where, where you want to be invariant. By understanding the relation, you can, you can basically apply, you, you, you can decide in each stage of this graph, you're gonna intervene so that you can be robust to this, to this specific, to this specific variables. Uh, from very related to this, the notion of domain shift. This, because this, as, as I said before, this IID assumption, this uh, independent and identically distribution, distributed data assumption is too strong. Real data sets are always biased because they are finite, right? You cannot have uh, images that are sampled from every single hospital in the world. It's impossible. So this, the conclusion is that understanding these causal models, understanding the data generation process, allows us to select the, the important equivariances and invariances. And from what I've seen, uh, most successful machine learning engineers and scientists, they're very good at understanding this and selecting, selecting the biases in their data to, to achieve better results. Uh, and now we I like to, to, to define a bit this implication of the information bottleneck, which is basically talks about uh, how an optimal representation is uh, in, in supervised learning. First of all, there are three properties. So the first one is sufficiency. It needs to be sufficient for the task in hand. And so if you look at the, the mutual information, between your latent representation and your output, it should be equal to the mutual information between your input and your latent representation, right? So basically it means that we want it to do the, we want the, the written representation to, to do the job, the task that you're assigned well. Uh, we want it to be minimal. So keeping as little information as possible about, about the input. So the, the mutual information between X and Z should be minimized. So such as we do not spend capacity on unnecessary information and it should be invariable to nuances. So we wanna be, when to ignore uh, small things that are not important for, for, for output. So this comes from this information bottleneck principle from Shib and Zalizvax and in the other paper from Swata's group. So now I finally arrived to these integral representations. And what they are, uh, basically they are, with these integral representations that try to capture the, the, fact, the factors of variation while discard as little information that is practical. And you're trying to, to keep information about the data, but in an organized and structured way. And in such a way that these latent variables can also be used to solve downstream tasks. 
and this should enable apply local interventions. So sampling, doing conditional sampling and creating counterfactuals, which are basically hypothetical scenarios can be seen as uh, a manipulation of an image such that uh, you can generate an image that didn't exist before. They, they are called counterfactuals because they, they are something that does not exist as opposed to a factual observation. Uh, so we try to formalize here following definition from, from this paper here from Higgins and all towards the definition of these integral presentations. And for that, they first define a symmetry uh, on a domain D here, a symmetry omega on the domain D. And a symmetry is, not, is nothing, it's just a transformation that leaves a part of the input unchanged. So if you imagine here, our first row being our input data, the second row would be a change of style. For example, here you can see the car changing color. And this is a symmetry because the shape, for example, of the car remains untouched. In this case, it's just the scale that changes. The, the rest of the car stays untouched, in this case, in the pose. Right. Uh, so imagine that you have our input image. We apply a transformation such that it is now uh, X prime. And then you pass both of them through encoders. And now we're interested in defining this, uh, this symmetry here, but on the latent space Z. And what we want is that Z will be disentangled if uh, omega x and omega, y, omega z are equivalent and a change of omega z will change just one factor of, of z. Imagine that z can be factorized in several parts and a change in omega, omega z will change just a, fact, a single factor of, of z leaving the rest unchanged, right? So <clears throat> that's, that's a a definition of this entanglement based on group theory uh, that was done in this paper. And, and it's very interesting for, for understanding the intuition behind it. We want to have uh, learned variables that if we intervene in one of them, the rest of them remain unchanged. And we're gonna see uh, a meaningful change in the image space, for example. So uh, a consequence, of these this representations uh, is this identifiability uh, result, which says that basically from a disentanglement perspective that learning these integral representations without supervision is impossible. Uh, and this, this result was found from, from several different uh, perspectives. So from the disentanglement perspective, from the causality perspective, they say that given a simple X, there is an infinite number of generative models that could have generated the, a sample from the same marginal distribution. And the nonlinear RCA uh, has this identifiability equation that uh, for the marginal distributions uh, to be the same, the, the parameters of the, these marginals need to be the same. Uh, which cannot happen in case uh, you don't have an, you don't have supervision. So this is, let me try to, to, to defend a bit better with this, this theorem from challenging common assumptions in unsupervised learning for of these integral representations from Locatello and all. Uh, so basically he's saying that if you have a representation PZ that is factorized as such, such a way that each component of Z is independent of the other, you have an infinite family of bijective functions such that if you make a transformation F on your, on your latent space, the, the marginals are gonna be the same. So I hope uh, that convinces you, but the intuition is that basically uh, a factorized Gaussian uh, on Z, if things are uncorrelated, if you if you rotate a uh, factorized Gaussian where each direction is independent is also a Gaussian, and if you collapse two Gaussians uh, by some the latent space is also a Gaussian. Uh, so in practice, 
the consequence of that is, is that in practice, we need restrictions. We need to use supervision, either fully supervised, semi-supervised or weekly supervised and inductive by, and or inductive biases. So as I said, most of this uh, talk until now was to advocate in favor of using inductive bias, in favor of using domain knowledge about, about your problem. And this, the solution for this ident identifiability problem has been inductive bias. And it has since always been very heavily used in deep learning. It was, it was always present in deep learning successes like CNNs, for example. Uh, the inductive bias there is that the, the neighborhood the, the neighborhood in the, of the pixels is important and recurrent networks, of course, is, is time and, and sequential information. So we're the last slide, I think. Uh, so disentanglement and representation, disentangled representations aim to give structure to the learned representations. So the useful biases uh, leads to identifiable models and one of the, the goals of this, this tutorial now is to, to highlight what are the various inductive biases that can be used for as building blocks for disentanglement. And so in this way, we can learn to, the, the main goal is, is teach people how, how to use disentanglement to achieve better representations by inserting domain knowledge. And what are the tools for that, right? So just to recap, so model learning, uh, the importance of invariances and equivariances, uh, what are generating factors, a causal perspective of that, what are the main shifts and the disentangled representation learning. So the formalism, identifiability results and why inductive bias are not only important, but essential and, and why do we need them to improve our representations? Uh, so yes, I'm happy to take any questions now. Let me see. Stop sharing for a second. <clears throat> so coming up, we're gonna see uh, other models that are important for, for reinforcing this, like which models we can use for reinforcing disentanglement. And after the break, as Soto said, yeah, we still, we still have a few more minutes. Uh, are there any questions? So, yeah, there's a question. Do you consider contrastive learning a subset of supervised learning? And in other words, can we obtain disentangled orientation using contrastive learning? So there is a very recent paper uh, I think ICLR 2021, showing that uh, contrastive learning isolates. So the terminology, the nomenclature that they use in the paper is uh, contrastive learning isolates uh, style from, from content. Uh, so basically you, you use domain knowledge the same way by, by defining the data augmentations, right? In contrastive learning. In contrastive learning, you are, you are basically defining your invariances by by applying data augmentations that, that you want to be invariant to. Uh, so you're saying that, I don't know, uh, the, the famous cropping from contrastive learning, I'm basically saying uh, this, it doesn't matter if I crop my image is still the same thing. Uh, I, I want to still have a, a same representation. So I, I guess, yeah. So in contrastive learning, you are learning a representation that is invariant to certain to certain, uh, to, to certain generated factors that, that you don't want there. Hello, so I, I think this is also uh, one section in, in our challenge part, in our challenges and opportunities part in, in the paper. So we have a paper upon accompanying all the material in this tutorial. We actually also covered this contrastive learning in, in, the, in the paper and feel free to, to check it a bit.
Can you hear me? Yeah, you should be able to hear me. Okay. So I think Valerio, in my view, contrastive learning is using implicit supervision versus explicit. It's still using supervision as a mechanism, uh, but it's not in the traditional sense of human provided supervision in an explicit fashion where you provide pairs of inputs and outputs, but you are providing, as Pedro said, an implicit supervision by how you encapsulate and how what, what invariances and equivariances you want uh, the representations to be invariant to or equivariant to. Um, I think um, that's, that's the best way I would say uh, to put it. Um, I think we all, as part all of the team here, I think we believe that contrastive learning has a lot of promise. Um, whether it can fix this entanglement by itself, I would say, I think we have a paragraph on that on, uh, on, on the paper, as Shao said. So, yeah, this is what my two cents, two cents in three minutes, uh, reply. I guess there is also a point that these these benchmarks that people is using, uh, like ImageNet, that you have one object in the in the center of the image. You have. I, what I'm trying to say is that I think we can use other types of inductive biases in medical imaging. Uh, I think we are as a community can be can be more creative than than just cropping the, the, the center of the, the dog and, and saying that you want to be very into that. Uh, ho ho hopefully there will be so, some interesting work in this direction. Like any any other questions? Hi, can I ask one? Yes, Go please. Ahead. Right. So you talked about uh, these inductive biases, right, and how they help us to define invariances and um, yeah, help with everything basically. Um, so I guess yeah, there are continents which do the, the pick at the pixel level. Then data augmentation for self-supervised learning or contrastive learning and uh, defining the invariances that way. Uh, are you aware of um, any other such tools? Like, I guess the, the, the problem is that we all know that defining invariances is good and should make our models more efficient and uh, perhaps have other beneficial things, but uh, there seem to be it seems to be really hard to do and there's a lack of tools of, of doing that. Uh, are you aware of any uh, research directions towards that? So I don't wanna give a spoiler of the, the next the next few sessions, but <laughs> there, there are several tools on content style disentanglement. So I just said before the, that the, this paper here is showing that contrastive learning uh, probably isolate the style from content. But what you can do is instead of doing augmentations, you can define an, an, an architecture that follows your, your biases. So that's something that we did in the group uh, with SDNet. We, we, we defined an architecture that uh, is, is, is isolating equivalent spatial information in one place and and invariant information uh, and, and, and style information in another, in, in another vector. So yeah, so I, I guess what I'm trying to, sh to show with this entire tutorial is that we, we, can, we can pass structure in a lot of different ways. And yeah, I hope you sit for, for the rest of the tutorial and we're gonna show which are the, the building blocks for that and, and which are the important models for, for doing that. Thanks. Um, there is a question about uh, about about the task on hand. So, uh, 
Zi Zikang uh, says, I'm working on a task that need to be that need to do a specific feature disentangle. For example, disentangle sex information from facial expression. Can we do this without any supervision? You know, you know, answer, Pedro. Oh, <laughs> well, so I think I can see something here. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, also tried to to extract such like gender and uh, uh, pathology information from from the image. Um. So for me, I don't think you can do it without any supervision. Like you, you even don't know uh, which gender this image, is, this patient is, and what kind of pathology it is. Uh, of course, you can somehow cluster them, but without any supervision or supervised information, I don't think it's achievable. But of course, you can somehow introduce some uh, some expert knowledge to to force the model to learn certain things without giving directly the supervision. So this, this comes to the balance of data set bias and also inductive bias and learning biases. We, we will show it later in the applications, uh, also in the disentanglement models, how those biases are, are connected to each other and how, how to design a, a model to to take the advantage of data set bias, like the sex information or face ex expression, they are somehow the, the data set bias. Yeah, also later, uh, actually Spiros will show you how to use some existing building blocks. I mean, they have code, so you can use them directly to, to build your model, to do your task on hand. So there, another question from, from Pablo, Pablo Messina. Uh, do you think these entanglement representations can help in the task of image-based repair generation? Uh... Uh, definitely, I mean, this is about EHR. So maybe Alison wants to say something. Well, Alison will present the, the relevant things later in the, in the application part. If I could uh, say something to Pablo, um, it's definitely possible to take advantage of the entire representations when you have this type of, I would say, kind of like translation task, but when the two modalities don't match, like you have an image to a text. Um, I think what I was going to show a slide here, but I can do that maybe towards the end. But what is very important when you have these different modalities is to think about the information density in each modality and what common factors, common generating factors they have versus unique generating factors. So if you try to go from a modality that will not have what are the generating factors of the output, uh, that's where you're gonna have problems. So assuming that they, their generating factors overlap and they match, then I think you will have uh, a good opportunities to be able to do such translation, trans translation tasks. On the other hand side, with this entanglement, you can always assume that as long as you can extract the good generating factors, you can always extract and identify those that you need to marginalize, that you need to basically consider them as, as stochastic. Uh, and that's possible. And Alison, I'm sure she will talk about electronic health records uh, soon. Um, 